of the power in the streets right now. Before I was a lawyer, I was a, a police brutality activist in New York City when Rudy Giuliani was mayor. I've been in the streets. I know what it's like to build leverage, to not sleep, to have three weeks feel like a year, and then to watch other people step into rooms and wonder if they're bargaining away your leverage for too little change. All of those forces, the young people, their mentors, the families, and the power in the streets, they have a claim on us right now. We cannot let this moment result one more time in window dressing or rearranging the furniture. I want to speak for just a few moments, if you'll indulge me, um, on things to keep an eye on as we take the next steps. First of all, you've heard a lot of discussion of the consent decree, the federal consent decree. And I just want to say to you, don't expect the court to do this work on our behalf. Do be alert, actually, for the court to step in between you and popular pressure and the public officials who we need to be holding accountable at this juncture. Why do I say this? I say this in the face of specific history in this case since 2013. Multiple times since 2013, this court has actually stood in the way of or offered a watered down alternative to needs and solutions that were identified by community leaders, many of whom are here in this park with us at this moment. Right now, you all have real, the real leaders of accountability, an accountability relationship with your elected city council, mayor, and other public officials. In the past, when community leaders have tried to exercise that power, the court has interceded, so going so far as to send a letter to the city council, a cease and desist letter, essentially, saying not to take the steps that the community asked for him to bring that up, um, is gone. We negotiated this contract, it won't be up again for three years. This is Rainier years. Avenue Radio. So World, your South Seattle community, Seattle community Radio, radio station, station, and we are yeah, live from so Jenkins Park at the Next Steps, Not well, This Time rally. Right now, the city's bargaining agenda is open. It has not been finished. So Stay this tuned. is the window. You are not too late. It is essential, like Diane said, I would put at the very top of the priority list that the city hang on to the leeway to make the kind of deep structural changes that everyone is calling for, that Spog could easily argue have to be bargained with them. Also, the 2017 accountability ordinance that so many in the community fought for that was promptly turned into Swiss cheese with the 2018 spot contract can be back on the table and be fought for in its entirety. To have the least chance that this goes well, there have to be accountability experts at that table with eyes on, and I'm not talking about just for transparency, I'm talking about experts working for the community because you know what? You can be sure that the union is expert in what they're trying to take and the people sitting there on behalf of the public need to understand what is going on. In 2018, by the time those who were expert got their eyes on that contract, it was too late. It was gone. So this time, eyes need to be in there and know exactly what is up. Okay. But my third point, though, is just my journey. Like, I was a youth once, now I'm an elder, an ex-youth. Um, back in my youth, I did a lot of work around police accountability, and I gotta tell you that if police accountability measures could change the basic dynamics of American policing, it would have happened already. There is no strategy that anybody in this park has about police accountability that is not in place on the ground in some community in America, and it basically always turns out the same. And that's why, clearly, 
Accountability is a floor but not a ceiling. It is necessary but not sufficient. We have to completely restructure how we secure public safety, public order, and public health. No one, let me be, let me be clear, no one should have to have contact with a police officer to get help. For too long, those of us who work in the criminal legal system have rationalized its functions by trying to make it nicer and kinder. But 90% of all the money that flows into that system pays lawyers, does not help people. And as our colleagues and comrades in Los Angeles in Justice LA say, you can't get well in a cell. If you designed a system to break people on purpose, you could not do a better job than the system that we've put in place to help people. So we need to make a fundamental break. Do not settle for accountability, insist on it, but demand a fundamental shift in the, in the paradigm. Let's stay together and build power, you're beautiful, thank you. Two, one, two. Uh, each one of these political powerhouses in their own rights are not up here because they haven't contributed to police accountability. Each and, up, each and every one of them, when I have called them out to fundraise, to, to support the initiatives that we had, they did was exactly what I asked them to do because they were interested in seeing some change. So I like judging people by some of the work. Like I said, understand this. I don't have to agree with somebody 100% of the time in order to deal with them. I didn't agree with my father. I didn't agree with my brothers and sisters. There's friends that I love that I don't agree with them. There's associates that I deal with that we might not agree 100% of the time. But wherever we can find an opportunity to build, that's exactly what we should do. And I'm gonna tell you, they did not have to stand up. When I asked, they didn't have to come. They didn't have the support. They didn't have to come to the fundraisers and make sure that there was money given to be able to pass this initiative. But each and every one of them have done that and I appreciate them and I ask you out of respect for the work that they've done with not, with not this time that you would give them a hand, please. Well, thank you, Andre. Thank you for your outstanding leadership. I'm Adam Smith. I'm the congressman who represents the 9th District here in the state. I came here to listen, not to talk, and I've listened and I've heard a lot and very, very heartfelt expressions and opinions. And as we look at all the reforms that you've heard so much about, and I'm, I'm not going to repeat, what I hope we remember as we work through this is the lives. That's what drives it. The stories you've heard of the people whose lives we have lost, the people who feel threatened, the pain that that causes to families across the community, the trauma that has been inflicted on black people in this country from the systemic racism, the trauma that has been inflicted on people of color, that's what's got to stay foremost in our minds when we go out and try to change it, try to take this moment, take this opportunity, and truly make a difference. And I know words at this point uh, from politicians don't, don't mean a lot. So I'm going to keep working with Andre, I'm going to keep working with all of you to try to make a difference in any way I can because I don't want to hear more about more of the suffering that we heard about today. That that hurts all of us deeply. If there is anything I can do to stop that, trust me, 
I will. And I'll work with all of you to try and make it happen. Thank you for the chance to be here today. Thank you, Adam. has decreased, the use of force against black people in this city is still 28% significantly higher than their population. We have in the council's June budget process an opportunity to take apart the budget and reimagine what public safety for this city really looks like. And nothing is off the table. The council is systematically questioning the specific roles that police currently undertake, and we're going to invest in evidence-based community alternatives so we can dial back our reliance on policing by identifying more effective public safety approaches that are community-based. We are analyzing 911 calls right now to see how many of them are for mental health distress or overdose or so-called social disorder to begin to determine how many calls should be sent instead to social workers or substance abuse disorder professionals, mental health experts, or violence disruptors. One study nationally shows that law enforcement spends 21% of its time responding to people with mental illness. That is wrong. Police should not be responding to these kind of calls. Dallas Police Chief David Brown said, every societal failure we put it on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding. Let the cop handle it. Not enough drug addiction funding. Let's give it to the cops. Schools fail. Give it to the cops. That's too much to ask. And please, he was never meant to solve all of these problems. One example that's happened here in Seattle just in the last couple weeks is that after a youth protest, the Seattle School Board has announced an end 
to having and so-called school emphasis officers stationed across the school. That's really the first concrete step that um, that we've seen happen in Seattle that responds specifically to the fund the police call. We've done some things. In the last two weeks, the city council has passed the law to require officers to show badge numbers. The city council wrote to the city attorney to withdraw the petition against the inquest form developed by King County Executive Dow Constantine. The city attorney withdrew it. The council passed legislation to ban chokeholds, including neck restraints, and to ban using crowd control weapons, including those used against protesters in the last few weeks. Last week, I announced my intention to introduce legislation to give subpoena power to the Office of Police Accountability and the Office of the Inspector General to require that uncooperative police officers give testimony in the investigation of complaints of misconduct. The council and the mayor are working together for transparency with community voices at the table, with expertise in police accountability to guide the city in bargaining the police contract this year. And the mayor issued an order requiring police to turn on their body cameras in demonstrations. The city attorney withdrew the court filing to end the sustainment period under the consent decree. And he's also announced he doesn't intend to prosecute the protesters. That, that's what the city's done in the last two weeks. But we've only done it because tens of thousands of people have contacted our offices and are in the streets demanding this change. But the call that has gone unanswered so far by the city council is the call to defund the Seattle Police Department and reinvest in community alternatives to make our black and brown community safer. The city council is going to be doing that and we're going to be working to dismantle our reliance on policing in Seattle. In the next four weeks, we're in a special budget process that we don't usually do because we have about 200 more million dollars less in revenue to balance our budget because of COVID-19. So we're in a special budget process just to balance our budget for this year. And we have four weeks to do this work. The mayor will be proposing a budget to the council and then the council will work to pass it. We're going to be focused on reducing funding for militarized police response, officers in our schools, officers that respond to complaints, and other funding in the black box that does not meet and serve the public safety needs of our community. And we are going to commit, I am committing, to reinvesting these funds into people and communities most harmed by their historical involvement with law enforcement. This is Rainier Avenue Radio Dot World Live at the Next Steps Rally, a Not This Time Los event this at Jenkins Park. Currently, we are listening to the City Council budget. Member Philadelphia Lisa last night voted to cut four percent of their police department budget. Our council has just started this King process, and we know that our budget is inaccessible, and we are committed to shift it. There is a very not long just how we fund police, but how we decide where city dollars go, and we are going to be working with you we will stay to develop a participatory budgeting process that involves and centers in South Seattle. black community, and that is immediately put in place for the 2020 budget rebalancing package. But the conversation will not end there. In September, we're going to start the budget process all over again for 2021 and 2022. And if we really want to dismantle the Seattle Police Department, I need you not just in the streets, but in the budget process. So thank you. It's a real honor for me to be here celebrating Juneteenth with you and celebrating freedom. And I'll make sure that I'm there watching over everybody's back with all these promises they gave us. Just trust me, I'll be there. I'm going to be there. I said, I'm going to be there. Yeah. It ain't going to get past me. I can tell you that. Promise you. We have our King County Executive, Dale Constantine. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Andre, for inviting me to be here today and asking me to talk about 
Inquests, the remaking of the inquest process that you and I and so many bereaved families worked on over the course of years. And I want to ask for your help at the end of this because we need your help to move forward with this community work. What's an inquest? It's, it's the coroner's report. It's mandated by the state. The medical examiner is supposed to say the who, what, when, where, and how when the state takes a life. But what we found over and over and what families expressed deep concern about, deep grief about, was when it, the question that got reported on the news was the why. And the why was always, well, I feared for my life. And that's what the people at home heard. They didn't hear everything else that happened. What they heard was, well, at he feared for his life, rally. therefore it must be justified. On Avenue Radio well, that subjective belief cannot be and was not intended to be justification for the state taking a life. And that's why we sat down and we worked with families, families of those who've been killed to come up with a new process, a new inquest process to inquire into not the subjective state of mind, but into the training that that officer received and the way they were equipped and the way they were mandated and the way they were acculturated, the, all that led to this tragedy so that we can get to the truth and we can demand that cities and counties and police departments upend that training and that equipping and that mandate so that people are no longer falling victim to state-sanctioned violence. And we were ready to go with that. And it took a long time and a lot of listening, but then we were sued. I was sued, we were sued by many cities across this county who did not want us to ask those difficult questions about police procedures and mandates. And I want to thank Lisa Herbold and Mayor Durkin for getting the city to withdraw their complaint against us, but we still have many cities that are suing us. Many cities that are suing us and stopping the process of families finding out truly what happened to their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, their child asking why their child is dead and asking what we can do to stop that from happening to any other parent. Well, this process can be one step in helping make that happen, but I need your help to ask the cities in King County to stop obstructing us, to stop suing us, to allow the inquest that these parents that you heard here today, these brothers and sisters, help make happen. Will you help make that happen? This is a moment for this community and this country. This is a time when we can move forward with the real work, with doing the work. But it can only happen if we demand that those running institutions and everyone who sits complacently at home changes. This is the time when America can finally reach for its potential. Will you make that happen? Will you make that happen? Thank you, Andre, for your leadership. Thank you. That was King County Executive Dow Constantine. Thank you, Dow. At the Next Steps rally. Next, we have Mayor Jenny time Jenny. at Judkins Park in South Seattle. <laughs> Live on Rainier Avenue Radio. World. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Dove. I want to say thank you to all the families who were here sharing and that is Mayor their pain Jenny and their grief. And the first time I met Andre before I ran for mayor, he came to me and said, I got this dream that we can get a state law that will change policing in this state. And I talked to him and I said, I think that's gonna be hard. And he said, I got it, we'll get it. You need to get behind us. And so I did and he did it, but he did it with you. And that was called Not This Time, and now we're here to talk about next steps. And the next steps, and I will tell you, I talked to Chief Carmen Best this morning, we talk every day, many times a day, she's sorry she can't be here. She, I could not ask for a better partner to say, how do we reimagine policing in this city? How do we make it so that when someone calls 911, we don't need a police officer with a gun most of the time. Wouldn't you rather see Dominique or one of the youths up here 
who could respond, who know the family, who can talk to people, or a mental health professional who can walk in the door and say, what do you need? How about when you call government, it isn't what is your emergency, it is what do you need? What help do you need? These last two weeks have been so hard, but so inspiring. We can't miss this opportunity. Tens of thousands of people in Seattle taking to the streets, but millions across America raising their voices because their voices have not been heard by me and other people in government. We need to do more. I need to do more. I need to do more. I am here not just because I'm Seattle's mayor, I am your mayor. And we know that we have got to change things fundamentally, not just in policing so that we think about what are those jobs that police don't need to do or want to do, but we need to change every institution. One of the meetings I had, someone said to me, they said, you don't understand when I saw what happened in Minnesota, not only had I seen that hundreds of times before, not only did it echo through hundreds of years of black experience, it was a symbol of your government. Because one part of your government had the knee on the neck purposely trying to kill me. But two others held the leg so I couldn't get up. And one turned his back as if he didn't care. We've got to change every institution every institution and it's not just policing it's got to be investment in community the community decides how and where it goes and i have said i will find a hundred million dollars to invest in community in our black and browns communities and it won't be government saying how it needs to go or where it needs to go we want community to decide where it goes because community knows the solutions you've seen them up here you've heard the voices so, <laughs> it's all right. This is Seattle. And that so, is in the end, I just want to say thank you for letting me come here. In front of I know it's been Jordan. heartbreaking, not just these last two weeks, but for generations. And so many young men and women have lost their hope. They lost their lives. We have a chance to change it. It's our job, together. It's my job listening to you. It's to empower those youth so when they walk out their door in the morning, they're not thinking about, will I live? They're thinking about how they're gonna invent the next beautiful, brilliant thing, or make the next beautiful music, or do whatever their spirit decides. Let's make that world for that youth they deserve. Thank you. audience member is asking Mayor Jenny Durkin, where will the money come from? It does not appear that we are going to get a response on that. We are live at the Next Steps rally. We By have the family time, to go first, but we have one more family member that we want to bring up. At Judkins Park in South Seattle on Rainier Avenue Radio World. Okay. Uh, this is Janet Hayes. Uh, <laughs> I'm Janet Hayes, and on April 29th, my nephew was murdered by the Seattle Police Department while holding his one-year-old daughter. His name is Sean Fuhrer, and I would like to thank the lady who mentioned him earlier. And I am a black mother of five sons, and I have five grandsons, and I have friends who have sons. And this has been such a tragic situation for my family. It's like the weight of my family's pain is upon my shoulders. And I know that I can bear it, but when I got the call, it was so devastating. And a mother hearing something that's happened to one of her children, it's very devastating. You don't know what to think. You don't know how to feel. There's all kind of different emotions that's running through your mind that you're feeling. And the first person my sister called was me. I didn't know if I wanted to bust through the door, I, if I could have 
blink my eyes and been there in an instant, I probably would have. But I am a black woman and I refuse to allow one of my children to be murdered in the streets by the Seattle Police Department. You cannot get away with hurting our loved ones, killing our loved ones, murdering our loved ones. He was shot in his head. He was unarmed. This is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. And yes, this has been going on for a long time, but when it hits your house, when it hits your house, it takes on a whole new light. Because yes, I was in the struggle before, but now I'm part of the struggle. This is my struggle. This is my friend's struggle. This is people all across the world's struggle. You cannot continue to sit back and allow stuff like this to take place in our neighborhoods. I looked at this stuff from afar. I heard my grandmother mention these stories. In the watch ride, I heard them, they went through this stuff. And to hear this on April 29th, I didn't know what I wanted to do. What do you think a mama bear does when you try to mess with one of her cubs? Do you think I was trying to uh, try to be nice about the situation? No, I wanted revenge. I wanted to hurt somebody from the Seattle Police Department about my nephew. It crushed me. I'm still crushed. So I'm having to make protest signs. You think that's easy making a protest sign for your nephew? Never in a million years. Never in a million years would I think that I would have to deal with something like this. And my sister can't do it. But I'm the older sister. I've always been taught to protect my siblings. And that's what I've done and I do it well. And so this is another way that I'm able to protect them. So I can't get violent. I wanted to get violent, but I am a woman of the cloth. So my God had to humble me. I paced in my house for days trying to figure out, trying to make sense of this. I cannot still can't understand it. I'm a black woman and you cannot murder our children. You cannot do this. What do you want me to do? Sit back and allow it? What am I supposed to do? When you murder my children, what am I supposed to do? Brush it up under the rug? I'm not brushing nothing up under the rug. So we're going to fix this community. You're going to fix it because nobody else's kids need to be dying because the Seattle Police Department murdered them while they were unarmed. You not murder our children. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. And I have grandsons. I fear for their lives. I fear for their lives. I should not be fearing for my children's life. If I don't beat my children, you cannot kill them. I don't beat my children. What gives you the right and the audacity to kill them? Shoot them in their head while they're holding their one-year-old daughter? And all you can say is, pick the baby up. He was shot by a sniper. They know where their aim is. We cannot continue to look the other way. You cannot justify actions of the Seattle Police Department. You can no longer do that. Pull the covers off of everything. Everything is being exposed. You're witnessing it, you're watching it. And it made me so upset when they, everybody in, in um, Washington, in Seattle, Washington was um, protesting for George but we got a murderous spirit going on in our own backyard, but nobody came out to march for Sean Fuhrer. No one came out to see what was going on about Sean Fuhrer, but the narrative was he abducted his own baby. The lies that the media tells you, they tell you lies. They feed your minds. But we can all get through this together. Thank you.
This is Rainier Avenue Radio dot world live from the Next Steps Rally. Next, we have State Senator Monka Dingo. By not this time at Judkins Park in South Seattle. Thank you, Dev and Andre. The unfortunate truth in America is that the darker your skin color, the harder life is for you. This is especially true when it comes to interactions with law enforcement. The darker your skin color, the more likely you are to suffer violence at the hands of the police. That is not justice. In a just world, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Emmett Aubrey, and every single name you heard here today and countless others would be alive today. I had hoped that Washington had made progress over the last several years to make this kind of injustice less likely here. In 2018, all of us overwhelmingly passed Initiative 940 to hold police officers accountable to excessive use of force. In 2019, the legislature unanimously passed legislation to affirm its attempt to make I-940 legally work workable. And just this year, the legislature passed the very first statewide Office of Equity in the nation to address the historical legacy of racism that impacts our current institutions. But I have been horrified, like all of you, at the aggressive paramilitary response by the Seattle Police Department to peaceful protesters. That is not justice. Especially when we do have examples of other law enforcement agencies who are doing better. We don't need warriors policing our streets. We need guardians in our community. I have spent my career building and advocating for an alternatives to incarceration. I've taught crisis intervention training for law enforcement for over a decade, and I've seen firsthand how well these things can work if they're done properly. I worked in the legislature to reform our law enforcement and criminal justice system. But the injustices that we are seeing today are a stark reminder that we have a lot more work ahead of us. We have to dismantle the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow that continues to exist in our society, our institutions, and our laws. And I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. Many legislators are nervous and uncomfortable addressing issues of policing and criminal justice. I've been doing a lot of education among my colleagues since being elected three years ago. But what it takes is hearing the voice of the community and they're hearing it now, loud and clear. So the question arises, how does change come about? Change will come when each and every one of us acknowledges the injustice. When each and every one of us grieves for that injustice, and when each and every one of us works to dismantle the systems of oppression and racism. The protests right here and around our country are a great upwelling of this righteous grief. And right now, all of you here are taking that necessary step towards real change. But it will take us many more steps to get to the just world that we all want. I want to acknowledge that our own state that lacks the voice of even a single black senator. We don't have a single black senator in the state of Washington. We have one running, but she hasn't won yet. Let's make sure she gets elected to the Washington State Senate. Twana Nobles, running in Pierce County. This is the voice we need to center us today and always. It is imperative that our legislative agenda be shaped by the community. Successful efforts towards change have always had their origins at the local level. I've been part of the Poverty Reduction Work Group, which has worked with communities across the state to develop an agenda to undo structural racism in state policy. This means taking on income inequality, decriminalizing poverty, and reducing our reliance on criminal and juvenile justice systems. 
Right now, the legislature is holding listening sessions with communities of color, the I-940 Coalition, DS Lake Washington, family members, and other groups that are impacted by police violence. We're listening to the community and developing, developing policies that reflect all of your ideas. Your agenda will inform our policies for the next session. So thank you for starting us on this journey for real, meaningful change by acknowledging this injustice, greeting this injustice, and I look forward to working with you to correct this injustice. Thank you. Thank you, Manka. Our Senator Manka Dingra. At the Next Steps rally by Not This Time at Judkins Park in South Seattle, live on Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. Um, this is extraordinarily an honor for me to, um, when you're doing work, uh, the way you can continue to do that work if people believe in you and believe in your vision and fund you. Um, these two have funded Not This Time, Seattle Foundation from its inception. Group Health has been an incredible blessing to continue what we do. Let me just say, not this time, not only fights for laws, but we've also, during this COVID, have given $30,000 to Northwest Kidney Center. Because we understand, did you know the first person that died from COVID was a, a dialysis patient? And we wanted to make sure that we were helping those seniors and people that are on dialysis that live before, uh, below the poverty line. But I couldn't do those things if I didn't have people who believed in the vision and funded our work and believed in our work. As I told you, we also do conversations with the streets that we bring black leaders and professionals from all over the country, uh, right here to Seattle, to uh, engage our youth and talk about how we can uh, have another path instead of violence. And that's been successful. So I would like to introduce the president and CEO of the Seattle Foundation, uh, Tony Mastris and the president and CEO from Group Health uh, uh, Foundation, uh, that's Nicole Mayer. I hope I didn't blunge at your name, so I want, I want you to keep supporting me. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Maher, and I stand before you as the president and CEO of Group Health Foundation. It is my honor to stand with the organizers of this event and to be supporting organizations across Washington as we demand a different future. A future without state-sanctioned or state-funded violence against black and brown people. My story isn't unique to Washington. I'm the granddaughter of Alaska Natives and Irish immigrants I was born in Alaska and raised in rural Washington and rural Oregon. I can remember being a kid in a small town in Jefferson County, Washington, and I can still smell and taste and feel the daily aggression and racism shown towards indigenous people, immigrants, black folks, and anyone who was viewed as an other, my family. I thought I could escape that world and move to the city only to be confronted with the sting of liberal racism and the corrosive effects of passive aggressive underestimation. Not this time invited us here today. They are one of many organizations we are funding to advance racial equity across this state. Last November, before any pandemic or before anyone's lives was stolen from them, be building this beautiful movement, they told us that police violence was the most pressing health issue for black and brown people in this state. And we believe them. And because we believe community knows best when it comes to public safety, We've committed to several years of funding them and a whole host of other folks across the state. 
We recognize that the work for a just and liberated future is not up to one nonprofit or one single executive director. Each of us alone does not have all the answers and no one organization represents an entire community. It will take all of us together using different tactics, standing in solidarity to make meaningful change. And here we are all together right now. What you are doing, protesting, attending this rally is so important. You are holding your government and your elected leaders accountable. You're holding your employers accountable and you're holding your friends and family to account. I also want to name that there's a whole other set of decision makers who have access to significant resources that need to be held to account. And I'm talking about foundations and wealthy donors. Wealthy donors and foundations that have access to hundreds of millions of dollars and give hundreds of millions of dollars away every year in this state. Organizations with little oversight and little accountability. Over the years, folks have meant well, but many foundations have perpetuated disparities in health, education, employment, and every aspect of well-being. Despite good intentions, our field has supported institu institutions that have favored the privileged and failed the vulnerable. Don't get me wrong, foundations and grant makers alike have long intended to make the world a better place. But billions of dollars later, what we have to show for ourselves is that we have devalued the people with the most knowledge and expertise to advance equity for their communities. Philanthropy has rarely acknowledged the ugly truth of our nation's history, the truth that our country was founded on chattel slavery and attempted indigenous genocide. The truth that shows the violence against black and native people has not ended, only shape-shifted to the form of police brutality and the prison industrial complex. As a whole, philanthropy has grossly underfunded the very communities facing the most inequity. In the last few years, we have talked a good game about equity, but the dollars have not matched our words. In this country, the thousand largest foundations gave less than 10% of their grants to organizations led by people of color. I've had the next and I suspect the numbers are worse in Washington. On James Baldwin once said, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. I think about these words every day and I have my own shorthand. I say philanthropy, I don't give a damn what you say because I see who you fund, I see who you hire, and I see whose voice you center. I believe we need to change philanthropy and be taken to account. We must recognize that anything we want to accomplish depends not on us, but on the community organizations and leaders we fund. We must acknowledge that we have been part of building an inequitable system and structures across the state and name that we have underfunded black and brown organizations to the benefit of white institutions. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder with community and fund the movement, fund advocacy, fund legal action, and use our power and privilege to ensure that change happens now. Most important, we must remember that beautiful community organizations and brilliant local leaders are all around us. They have always been there. They know what equity looks like for their people and they know how to get there. To my peers on the stage who are in charge of philanthropic resources and who hold elected office, now is the time for philanthropy and government to fund the people who are doing the work. I call on you to commit profound resources to organizations by and for communities most impacted by inequity and to center Black-led work. To all of you in the crowd, Thank you for being here and standing strong and demanding change. We at Group Health Foundation invite you to hold us accountable. 
Our core belief is that solutions to institutional racism, health inequity, and social injustice originate in the heart of communities with the leaders they already have. Imagine the kind of society we can build together if we only have the courage to follow your lead. Go next, Chish. And that was Nicole Maher, the CEO of Group Health Foundation. President and CEO of Seattle Foundation, Tony Mastro. Tony Mastro. I want to just reflect on two things. The first one is maybe you could join me in thinking about the Community Passageways kids and the courage that they all showed today. Well done, Don and the team. And Nicole, I so appreciate you as a colleague in this field. You spoke the truth um, so perfectly. Uh, Andre, Doug, thank you. We are just so honored to be here today. It is, uh, for me personally, an honor of a lifetime. It's such an important day to recognize the work that Not This Time does and also commemorate this incredibly important day and uh, Juneteenth and everything that it represents. Uh, I'm here because Seattle Foundation was fortunate to make the very first investment in Not This Time in early 2017. This is a truly humbling honor for us. In 2017, our team created a program to build and support community resilience. Many people were facing increased threats, particularly immigrant and refugee communities, black and indigenous communities. We asked a simple but profound question. How are you dealing with the emerging challenges to the well-being of your community? Our vision is to support a region of shared prosperity where everyone can thrive, regardless of race, identity, or place. I also have the honor of working with incredible people, folks who do this work from a place of personal and professional experience. One of those talented team members is Jonathan Cunningham, who many of you may know. He's been working closely with Andre. He was here earlier, but his, his little girl, I think, is turning two, and he had to go off and do, the, do that priority, which he should. Uh, but, you know, Andre, and not this time, stepped forward with a proposal focused on police accountability and to provide support for families who were suffering as a result of police brutality. Not this time was a brand new organization but it had expertise, the kind that can only be gained through lived experience. At Seattle Foundation, we're committed to supporting organizations that are deeply rooted and trusted in their communities. Jonathan recognized Andre's leadership and vision and recommended that we take a chance with that first grant. That investment has paid off in so many ways. In the three years since that first investment, we proudly continue to support Not This Time, including two very recent grants, one from our COVID-19 response fund to support their work around food security, another from Communities of Opportunity, our partnership with King County. Not This Time is also part of an intentional cohort of Black-led organizations that we've brought together and we intend to support for as long as they ask us to. Our intention with this pilot is to really learn from and be better in partnership with organizations like Not This Time. Meanwhile, Not This Time has accomplished so much, including major meaningful policy reform to increase police accountability in Washington, as we've talked about today, and in supporting grieving and traumatized families that has helped them become advocates for change. It has given us the opportunity to listen and to learn and to apply that learning to all of our work. We all know that Not This Time's efforts to address police violence and the murder of black people is as important as ever, if not more so. Part of why it's important to fund these organizations and others is to ensure that people who are black can feel safe in their communities. That what happened to Che Taylor doesn't happen again. That others are not killed at the hands of police. It is important that in these difficult times, philanthropy steps up like it hasn't in the past and fund black-led organizations and movements. In fact, with us today are Michelle Merriweather and Andrea Cowpen, two of the four visionary women and architects behind the Black Future Co-op Fund that launched this week to support Black-led organizations. We must fund Black-led organizations and movements. We must also fund racial justice organizing. We must fund advocacy and efforts to change the systems that perpetuate the inequities and disparities due to racism. And we must challenge ourselves and all of our community to be better. Thank you very much.
Okay. Up next, we have our very own, speaking of, Michelle Merriweather, CEO, President of the Urban League. Did I turn it off? No. Then we'll have Monisha Harrell. She's the chair of the Equal Rights Washington. I'm not a preacher like my brother Andre <laughs> or my brothers Dom and Will, but I believe in them and their work and do everything I can and everything in my power to offer them space to give them, give them voice give them counsel when they need it, they give it to me. And for that, I'm, I'm here, for that reason I'm here and for that reason I'm grateful. And every time I think of Andre, Dom, Sean, I think of this great poet from LA, Tupac Shakur. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's law is wrong. Learn to walk without having feet. Funny, it seems, by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. This reminds me of those young people that elevated their voice today. This movement is not about me. This movement is not about us. It's about them, making sure that they have a future, making sure that their children have a future. And so when Andrea, myself, my uh, co-conspirators, Angela and Tawana went to philanthropy, Nicole and uh, Tony and others, and said, we, we've got to do something different. We've got to do this different. Yes, we have relationship with you as the Urban League, a 90-year-old civil rights organization in Seattle that has been providing resources on a one-on-one basis for uh, folks in community for 90 years, housing people, feeding people, uh, pivoting when necessary during COVID to open shelters for people in need. But it's not about us. It's about those folks on the Eastern side of the Washington where black folks are 2% of the population and feel like they're completely invisible. It's about um, organizations like progress pushers that you don't even hear about that are in community doing work every single day. It's about organizations like Nurturing Roots that you don't even hear about, that are feeding people every single day. And so when we went to philanthropy and said, it's time to invest in those organizations and those people and those children's dreams, they said yes. They said yes in this moment, but it is our responsibility and hold us accountable to it and them to make sure that this fund changes a generation that this fund not only changes that generation, but the generations to follow it. And so we, we stand together with you as community. We're gonna do our part to uplift and hold those accountable that are in positions of power, but we ask you to not stop when you're tired. We've been doing this work for a long time. We need you. We don't need allies, we need co-conspirators. We allies are cheerleaders on the side. We need co-conspirators in this to strategize with us to think with us, to give us voice and spaces that we have no voice. And so we need you to keep going even when you're tired, because we're tired, I'm tired. And I need you all to help us keep this fight going until victory is won. Thank you. That was Michelle Merriweather of the Seattle Metropolitan Urban League at the Next Steps Rally by Not This Time at Judkins Park in South Seattle, live on Rainier Avenue Radio. Thank you. I want to thank um, Not This Time for pulling this together today. Uh, to be here in this, the, the month of pride, the day of emancipation, it is a joy, a special joy for me today. My name is Monisha Hurl. I'm the board chair for Equal Rights Washington. We are a statewide LGBTQ organization. And I want to do a couple things that might make you feel happy and it might stretch you a little bit. Let me hear your lungs a little bit. Can I hear you say, Black Lives Matter? Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black lives matter. Okay. If you're not there,
there yet, get there. I want to hear you say, Black Trans Lives Matter. Black Trans Lives Matter. One more time for me. Black Trans Lives Matter. We are here for all of our black people. We are here for all of our people. In preparation for Juneteenth, I like to do a lot of reading because it is within our ancestors that our strength comes from. And one of the things that I stumbled upon was the works of Frederick Douglass. And the time period that we're in right now his words are even more apropos. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power never concedes. Power concedes nothing without a demand. We have not demanded enough. They give us some crumbs and we leave the table but we're still hungry. Power concedes nothing without a demand. If we stop demanding, they will determine what it is we are satisfied with and that is all we will get. They expect us to be satisfied with a little bit of crumbs that they're gonna throw us and say, but we're all good now. But are our communities whole? The question and the answer, no. They have for decades dangled in front of us. Well, if you behave, you'll get this. And as soon as we calm down, it all gets pulled back. You'll see it this year. You'll see that, well, we've had all these cuts because of COVID. We would love to give it to you now, but uh -oh. Uh -oh. wait on. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. How long have we waited on this time? This country has been built on the backs of enslaved people. This is our day of emancipation. This is our day to celebrate our freedoms and claim our due for all black people. Frederick Douglass also said, I prayed for freedom for 20 years. He was born an enslaved person. I prayed for freedom for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. What are your legs doing? Where are your legs taking you right now? What are your legs doing to help this struggle in this movement? What I want more than anything else is for our children to have a childhood. Our youth from Community Passageway spoke so eloquently today. And I don't want a future where our children have to do that. I don't want a future where our children have to throw away their childhoods in order to negotiate around being able to live in this country. That is not the future that we were promised. That is not the future that we were told we would have when we got our emancipation. And if we want our grandchildren to have a future and to have a childhood, we have to pray with our legs. I wanna thank the families. They have put their grief on display for us so many times to motivate us to action, and they shouldn't have to do that, but they do. It is not without them that we could do this work. And they belong to a club that none of them want to be in. But for all that they give, we need to meet them halfway. Don't let their grief, don't let their pain be for nothing. They relive it every time they tell us their stories so that we can pray with our legs.
Their pain should mean something. Their loss should mean something. Juneteenth, our ancestors were enslaved people, the ones we can name, the ones we can put names and faces to, the ones that we have in our scrapbooks. We owe this to them and we owe this to our future. Celebrate this day and continue our fight. Thank you so much. And that was Monisha Harrell, the chair of Equal Rights Washington. I know we've stemmed out a little bit and that's only because there's several events going on today. So I appreciate you for holding on as we come to the end uh, of this particular event. So just thank you guys for holding on in there. We have some other, a few other people and we're gonna let you go. I can tell you that this right hand is COVID resistant. <laughs> Cannot touch that hand. Next up, we have, okay, uh, Lynn Tai, Director of Vietnamese Community Leadership Institute. We have Pastor Willis, the coming president of United Black Christian Clergy of Washington. Bishop Tyson from the Goodwill Missionary Baptist Church. And Pastor Jamal Cole from Greater Gospel Temple. Up next, Lynn Tai. We are live at the Next Steps Rally by Not This Time at Judkins Park in South Seattle. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for indulging me, uh, Andre and Doug. You know, um, not many of you know me, but I, me and Andre, we refer to each other as the brother of a different mother. Um, and it's true in a number of ways, and it's, you know, I may not, on the outside, look like I'm a black person. <laughs> kind of obvious. I hate to say that. Um, but my journey in America, um, sort of my education about the African-American struggles began when I was in wearing the uniforms of this country in the service of this country, serving the army for 10 years. And it began with a, another brother from a different mother named Ronald Carr. And Ronald was an 82nd Airborne Division paratrooper that I had the pleasure to work and jump with in a couple of campaigns. And through him, I learned the incredible sacrifice that African Americans and Blacks have given to this country, building this country. The crazy thing is you still have to give blood to ask for something to be treated as equal as everybody fucking else. I came to this country because 50,000 Americans gave their lives to a place that they've never been before. And many of them, people of color, Latinos, Hispanics, African Americans, from all walks of life, giving lives to something that they may not believe, but they did it anyway, in the promise that they will be treated equal. But the crazy thing is supposed to be treated equal in all the beginning, all this stuff anyway. So I'm a little bit pissed. I've been angry for all these decades because I kept on seeing my brothers and sisters not being given equal treatment under law. That was one story. The other story is when Tommy Lay was shot and killed in the back by the sheriff's office. And it was Andre not this time, and the whole movement of the Escalate Washington came to the Vietnamese American community and me and said, we're standing with you brothers because we feel your struggle and your pain. Until today, three years later, Tommy and his family has not received justice. So um, I'm gonna just close with a really, really quick short one and that is, you guys making me feel loved. And I'm every bit of fucking black as you out there. 
I think I think I'm the only one who's been swearing. I think I'm the only one who's swearing so far. But it's like that's just how I feel. That's like how raw I feel for the last few decades. But this is how this is how crazy the system is. This is how systemic it is. Because I know, and I'll tell you for a matter of fact, that there are police officers, sheriffs, who are who have to cave in that system. They told me in person that they knew that Tommy was not holding a knife. They told me in person. But if it weren't for my relationship with, with those officers, if it weren't my relationship with city government and state governments and all those legislators, I couldn't pull them together and made the sheriff to lie in front of us, continue to lie in front of us. So I'm here to tell you that allyship works, that people you can trust in governments and in other institutions and build true, true allyship so that we can win the struggle once and for all. Thanks for your time, guys. We are live at the Next Steps Rally by Not This Time at Judkins Park in South Seattle, live on Rainier Avenue Radio. And Here they are, we are about to close up this event. On the holiday celebrating and commemorating what we know as Juneteenth, which spotlights two Independence Days of Black Americans. One commemorates freedom from Britain's rule, the other celebrates when a Union general showed up in Galveston, Texas, and delivered the message that actually ended slavery, that actually ended two years earlier. Wait, hold, wait a minute, back that up. Abraham Lincoln already signed the Proclamation of Emancipation and nobody told the slaves in Texas. Juneteenth, the day marking the end of slavery in America that we call Black Independence Day, it's time for this country to come to some reckoning around race. We need to abolish the two systems of justice in America, one that works for one group and another that does not work for the other group. Please, America, lean this way. Take the system's knee off our necks. Only in America, black people encounter police who are the judge, the jury, and the coroner on the same street. Dying black should not be a pre-existing condition while brothers are dying. Our black skin is not a sin. Where's Marvin Gaye when we need him? What's going on? Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, brother, there's too far many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love here today. Then he drops down. And he says, picket times and picket signs. Don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me so you can see, oh, what's, what's really going on. I thank God for white people with a conscience that have the soul of black people within them. We call them brothers from another mother. I encourage you to continue to stand up, speak up, show up, and then step up. If America is going to heal and America is going to be whole, if America is going to heal from the virus that began at the founding of this country, be healed from hypocrisy of the nation's practicing of democracy. Because you said all men were created equal. At the same time, you treated black people as less than human. You never recognized our humanity. Could it be? That's the problem with police officers. It's in their DNA to criminalize black people and demonize black people to justify how they treat us every day of our lives. There is another virus 
it didn't show up in 2020. There is a virus in this country that is more deadly than COVID-19. It is the virus that victimizes the black man. Too many of us live in a zip code with environmental racism. David Williams of Harvard says, your life expectancy is determined not by your genetic code, but rather by your zip code. There is a difference between charity and justice. Charity is nice, it's cute, it's all puffed up. It comforts your conscience. It comforts your white privilege. It comforts your white guilt. It makes you feel good or feel better because you're throwing us a nickel when we really need a dime. Charity isn't justice. See, charity is you giving money to feed the hungry, but justice, figure out a way to make sure I'm not hungry next week. It's the injustices that make charity necessary. It's the injustices that make charity necessary. Or the inadequacies of this century must be changed. What do we need? I'm so glad you asked. We need economic justice. What do we need? I'm so glad you asked. We need environmental justice in our country. Here it is. This is 2020. It is the year of the most important election in the history of all elections. Black America, listen. We must stay woke and not allow, not COVID-19 to plague us in November, but we can't allow COVID number 45. Not coronavirus, but Corona Trump. My word today is the black church, which I represent well with these pastors. And I want to say to Lady Doug, and I want to say to Andre, I don't know where we was, but we here now. And I think it was the rapper that Mike Jones that says, back then you didn't like me, now I'm hot, you're all on me. Well, we with you now. I can't justify where we was at the beginning, but we're here to work with you in the middle. Understand, the black church is on the front street. L.A. Wetcho was right when he said the black church was born as a protest movement. Henry Mitchell was right when he said it was the black church during slavery movement that every black church had a preacher who used his or her pulpit as a platform for abolition. Every black church, and I'm calling you out, need to be engaged in an overground railroad, not an underground railroad. As I close, when a person has been oppressed by a system, overlooked by a system, opposed by a system, they're left with no choice but to put their guards up and fight against that system. For every mountain you brought me over, for every trial you seen me through, for every blessing we say hallelujah. For this God we give you, we give you praise. We, we have this theology of liberation and freedom. We shall overcome, I believe one day we shall overcome. Hallelujah. It's not black against white. It's everyone versus racism. As I said at my church on Sunday, this is not a moment. This is not a minute. This is not a month when black America is mad. This is a movement. Why? Because in black America, somewhere around Psalm 23 verse 5, David said, my cup runneth over. And then he goes on, he says, it's with goodness and, and mercy. But I'm here to tell you, in black America, our cup runneth over and it's with knees on our neck. I'm black every day. 
not just not black and black history month i'm black every day i'm just not black on juneteenth well let me just say it like this since we're here since it is juneteenth i'm more blackity black than i've ever been black y'all catch that on your way home let me say it another way i'm black on steroids today i was born black one day i'm gonna die black but I don't want to die because I'm black. Mm. Also, as scripture says, after all this, if God be for us, who could be against us? I stand today united with these pastors as coming in president of United Black Clergy. This gathering today was for what's next? What's the next steps? As we come to, together today, next steps is to approach police accountability, to approach law enforcement on uh, systematic racism in law enforcement. Next steps are that we come together and go to the training facilities of the police departments and see how they're being trained to come into our community and police us when we know we can police ourselves, but we need trained officers coming into our community dealing with our black people. What we come today for next steps are high level of police uh, uh, lieutenants, sergeants, and our chief taking accountability for the officers that are under them when they mistreat us in the community. Next steps are we're going to hold them accountable and be able to 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 bring charges. That's that's what we got to have policies that bring charges against these officers. We got to be able to put procedures in place to when they come into our community, they need to talk to us first and let us know how they're policing. We need to have those that want to ride along and see how they're operating in the community. The next steps are we're going to go to Olympia, talk with the governor, have us set down some policy, talk to legislators and pass some laws that will hold these police accountable for killing us. I want you to do something with me. Hold your hand, your arm up. Have your hand spread out. You see your fingers here. Today, our fingers represented everyone that spoke today, everyone that came here today. But as we bring it together, each finger, each thumb, bring it together. What is that form? A powerful fist and a blow against police brutality, against law enforcement. You know why? Because black lives matter. Yeah. Come on. And I just say, let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank God for not this time. For everyone that has spoke today, for every preacher, church represented here today we come as one we come excited about what God is doing in these last and evil days so as we stand together to speak truth to power God is with us as we move forward back in the day when they were back in the basements rallying together a Philip Randolph all the pastors and preachers and, and, and those Congress people that wanted to work with them, they came together. That's what I see today, us coming together, putting, a, putting away any differences that we had about anything we may have had a problem with and coming and standing together on one cause for truth, for justice, for black lives today. Come on, put your hand, your right hand together, your left hand together. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you, Andre, for allowing us to be here today. God bless you, and we are with you. We are live at the Next Steps Rally by Not This Time at Judkins Park in South Seattle.
an education community event on things in our city and state that have been an impediment to equity and police accountability. Live on the new radio.